FOMO. Here's a powerful question to ask yourself. If you're a hire manager, founder, whatever, you, you're, you need to make an important people decision. I want you to imagine that there's five talented, capable people who can get this job done. But I want you to imagine that four of them are going to end up unhappy. You're not going to work well together, despite the fact that they have all the potential and all the motivation in the world. Why would that be? What kind of otherwise capable person would end up being ineffective or unhappy in this role because of you? I'm Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. And it's why some people end up following the crowd when they should be blazing a trail of their own. But if you want to achieve greatness in business and life, you've got to break free. Come on, I'll show you how. This is FOMO Sapiens, where we explore how entrepreneurial thinkers find the inspiration and the courage to build exceptional lives. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of FOMO Sapiens, the show for entrepreneurial thinkers. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, and today we're talking to Jordan Burton, founder of Talgo, a hiring and interview skills training firm. Now, over the past 17 years, Jordan has conducted hundreds of multi-hour interviews with CEOs and other C-level candidates on behalf of major private equity firms and corporate boards. He has leveraged his experiences to train the leadership teams, thousands of top BCP investors and executives at high growth companies to become exceptional at hiring and interviewing. And his background includes roles as a partner at GH Smart and a consultant at Bain & Company. And Jordan was my classmate at Harvard Business School. But the part that I like, I mean, that's all good. It's a nice background, but I was a child actor. <laughs> Can you tell? So Indeed. Welcome, Jordan. Before we get in, I just want to hear, just tell the people what you were in. Oh, tell my them. goodness. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's true. I was starting at like age seven. Uh, I was the mayor of the Munchkins, and I went to this kind of artsy high school, in, or not high school, like, uh, uh, you know, K through 12 in Dallas, and ended up doing the commercial thing. And I guess the, the short answer is a low-budget movie with Lou Diamond Phillips called Dakota, and then Problem Child, the original Problem Child, remember the, little, the redhead kid who caused all kinds of, yeah, I was the cross-the-street neighbor, so those were my, those are, that's my IMDb kind of full stop, nothing else. By the way, it's interesting. Uh, I was a child actor in regional in, in my local theater company in Sanford, Maine. So not as good as you. And one of my roles That's was awesome. playing the mayor of Munchkin City. You are kidding me! I'm the mayor of the Munchkin City and the county of the land of Oz. I welcome you most. Something, yeah. You know the one difference though is that ours was actually the Wiz, which was like the jazzy kind of more edgy version. Wow. So all the songs were different, but I love it that we were the same role. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I was wearing um, I was wearing very tight emerald colored bell bottoms. Oh so. yes, uh, obligatory if you're a Munchkin. Yeah, it's the oh way. boy. All right, so Jordan, now yep. that we know that about you, this is pretty cool actually. I like to start all of my interviews with the same question, huh? and even the mayor of Munchkin City cannot escape this question. So the question is this: Tell me something unexpected you learned about yourself that changed everything. Oh, something unexpected I learned about myself. I think I learned that I have a deep desire and um, energy source in just interacting with other people. I always thought that I was drawn to ideas and concepts and things. And it was probably pretty far into my 20s where I realized, and it changed everything because it certainly has informed the path I've chosen, I'm super fed just by interacting with people. Hmm. Isn't it nice when you figure that out? And then, cause I think like part of what life is, is like, we try to, we, it's like, oh, I should be a hedge fund manager. And then you're like, <laughs> no, that is not my path. I'm going to do something else. And when you realize that and you stop trying to be somebody else or live somebody else's dream, that's when you can truly experience greatness. I, I think all satisfaction comes from just having the, first of all, the self-awareness to know what it is for you. But then also there's, for, for many people, there's kind of a courageous thing of like saying, I need to follow that. I need to go with that, which I know is near and dear to your heart, but yeah. absolutely couldn't agree more. Find what all you right. just love intrinsically. If you're, if you're fighting against that, 
that doesn't end well. Yeah. So that is, that is the topic today. You have leaned into that because you're, you, you're building a company you've been building and you continue to build a company called Talgo, which is really, I mean, it is about, I mean, it's what you do now is it's yeah. interacting with people. Talk about Talgo. My understanding it's talent algorithm, shortened Talgo. That's your FOMO, I guess. That's what you're, that's, that's right. The I, word you invented. Um, oh talk my, about the yeah. business and what you, what it does. I would have to uh, credit my my fabulous co-founder, Matt Walsh, for coming up with Talgo. I think it's great. But yeah, so it actually is a new name for an older business. So I've actually been at this thing of teaching people how to hire and how to interview in particular for a very long time. Call it, you know, 15 plus years. Mm-hmm. Um, on my own for, call it 10, 11 years at this point. Uh, we rebranded Talgo because we really wanted it to be, it's not about any, it's not about me or any individual person. We really wanted to create an entity that means something that has a set of principles, methodologies that are scalable and repeatable that aren't just about us and the way that we do things. So yeah, it's, it's been an incredible journey of just kind of taking this concept of like data driven hiring. We can actually put facts behind something that's inherently squishy and subjective people decisions who's the right fit for a role. The whole concept is that we actually can put science and rigor. Sure, there's still going to be some art. It's still human beings after all, but there's a way to do it with some, with some rigor. Uh, that's really been our battle cry since, since the beginning. And so what's the product? Uh, it's interesting. There's a variety, but at the end of the day, the product is a transformation that you have in yourself where you're really, really good at spotting who's a good fit and who's not. Um, if I were to say to you, I mean, we really work a lot with like startup founders, hiring managers of all stripes and all different organizations, but people whose jobs are predicated on like surrounding themselves with awesome talent. That's who we're serving. And what we're selling is turning them into somebody who can repeatably and scalably get it right to be able to just very accurately hire people who are going to be amazing and avoid those painful hiring mistakes where we don't get the job done and the person's miserably and like miserably and unhappy and everybody loses. We sell like the absence of hiring mistakes. Let me, this is super cool. Okay. Now I have questions. I mean, I had questions before I'm going to continue, but so like, uh, let's imagine, okay, you have a person who's hiring. Okay. You have two candidates and you know, they're, they're both, you know, one's better than the other, or, or they have different skills. How much of the talent hiring decision is about the raw capability of the candidate? And how much is it about like the person, the nature of the person who's doing the hiring decision and who they are? You know what I mean? Oh, interesting. Oh, there's, I thought you were going to go a different direction with that. And I love that. I love that. How much of it is about that what's inherent in the candidate and how much of it is about the skills style management approach of the hiring manager. Yes. Of course the answer is both. And that's going to, it's kind of a drag when someone says like it's, it depends or it's both. I think, well, no, not if they explain (laughs) why then they sure let them do that. Yeah. I I think it almost just goes on. Like you can almost take it on faith that of course it's about the capabilities of the candidate. No one would say that it's, it's not about that. So there is like a whole process of going deep and understanding who is this person, what makes them tick, what are they great at, what are their internal capabilities, motivations, competencies, et cetera. But I would say most hiring managers under under index on who am I and what does that imply about what fit means. So this whole thing around science and data-driven hiring is predicated on like fit to role. It's not an absolute who's good and who's not good. It's who is the right fit for this role and a significant part of that question of, of role is the, the boss. Because if you think about like, if you've ever left a role, if you've ever been unhappy in a role, significant portion of that is because somebody's unhappy with their manager. They, they say like, people don't leave jobs, they leave bosses. Well, if you're the hiring manager, that's you. So get clear on like, hey, I'm, I have a tendency to micromanage. Hey, I tend to be pretty emotive and expressive and it can catch some people off guard. Hey, I, I'm very data driven, and I like everything to be quantified. Fit to role involves understanding who you are, how you like to lead, and avoiding hiring otherwise great people who are going to not like your style. 
Yeah. It makes me think, I mean, I'm, I'm still, I'm forming my, my thoughts around this, but like, I imagine if you were to take a pool of candidates, figuring out how how fit to roll among the candidate pool and their skill set and their personalities, like there's probably a lot less variability than when you look at the hiring person who has never Mm. been trained and doesn't know what the heck they're doing. There's probably a lot more variable. So if you can get that upskilled to the point where those people are all trained up and capable, then you you probably, they might make different choices, but the, the, that's where the work needs to happen. For sure. Here's a powerful question to ask yourself. If you're a hire manager, founder, whatever you, you you need to make an important people decision. I want you to imagine that there's five talented, capable people who can get this job done. But I want you to imagine that four of them are going to end up unhappy. You're not going to work well together, despite the fact that they have all the potential and all the motivation in the world. Why would that be? What kind of otherwise capable person would end up being ineffective or unhappy in this role because of you? And that that question might lead you to, the the whole thing is like, it's easy to say, we don't want to hire the person who's not super competent, the person who's not a self-starter, the person, and make it about the person. But if you say, no, let's say that the person is totally capable of doing it, but it still doesn't work out. This is not a happy marriage. What's the most likely reason? That may lead you to, ah, it's probably because they needed more direction than I like to give people. Mm. Or they struggle with really direct feedback, which is kind of my jam. FOMO. FOMO. Wow. And so you're not telling the hiring manager to change who they are necessarily. You're just telling them to be mindful and in touch with what kind of leader they are so that when they're hiring somebody, they find somebody who responds well to their leadership style. Largely, yes. Though I will say there are certain things you may be doing as a manager that are not good, (laughs) right? Right. If you're discriminatory, if you are aggressive or hostile with people, if you are completely giving no guidance or direction to people that you bring on board. Now it's not really about trying to find a candidate who's a great fit for your style. There, it is about changing you. Yeah, You have a development need as a leader. Uh, I'm saying there's a lot of different ways to lead. There's no one right or wrong way. I would say find the ones that happen to be your way that aren't necessarily bad, <laughs> that are yeah, counterproductive, yeah, yeah, yeah. that aren't setting you back. Totally. I, I think that's right. I was... Let me, let me, yeah, let, almost like right, right now the hot topic is founder mode versus manager mode. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. sure you've been hearing about that. So like yeah. those can both be good, yeah. but, and, and there, there are different types of people who respond to that. Being a bully or being um, an intolerant person or whatever, those then, yeah, the, you can't fix that. Nobody's going to stick around for that unless they just have no other options. Yeah. It's important to be in an environment where, you know, it may not be something that's super just way over the top awful. But there may be subtle things that you're doing as a leader that narrow the pool of people that you could hire. And it's wouldn't it be nice to have a, a larger labor pool to draw from? Like, hey, if I just got better in the way that I communicate expectations and I follow up, that it would actually triple the number of people that I could work effectively with. Wouldn't that be nice? So mm-hmm. there may be things that may not be just outright blatant liabilities, but just we all can develop as leaders and as managers and as founders, right? Totally. Okay, Jordan. So yeah. I imagine people are listening right now because I know my FOMO sapiens and they're thinking to themselves like, I'm like, okay, I'm probably doing this wrong. So talk about some of the mistakes, the things that you really target that you help people to, to learn in the hiring process when, when you have a person who's making a hire. What are the kinds of things that kind of low hanging fruit kind of stuff that you can sure. focus on? I'll see if I can do, uh, I get this question a lot. And it, of course the answer is there's so many. Yes. But if I kind of like, where, sort that's why you got to hire Jordan. But like, you know, <laughs> if I sort, if I like take that, that database and sort it by frequency, mm-hmm. um, there's kind of one in, in different, there's one I can think of in different parts of the hiring process. But one of the big ones is not knowing what you're hiring for. It mm-hmm. is unbelievable to me, even in like established scaled up companies where there is some clarity around what the business is trying to get done. The business plan is relatively known. People don't take the time to just say, what is it that this person needs to get done? They just say, Hey, I I need somebody to, uh, I need a, 
legal analyst, or I know I need a, uh, an account exec. We need a, a direct salesperson. And they don't really stop and think about what does that person need to get done beyond maybe just the superficial thing of hitting their quota, right? So actually spend some time before you look at any candidates to get clear on what needs to happen in the business. What, what's the business need that's underpinning this hire in the first place? So failure to define the role would be really high on the list, way up there. I, I would also say kind of a corollary to that. Some people, a, a lot of hiring managers are just like, let's just go interview some people and see what we like and see what we don't. Kind of the window shopping model of hiring. It's a different flavor of not knowing what you're hiring for, but you're just asking to invite your biases and your preferences to take over and for your rational mind to take a back seat. You're going to just be drawn to certain kinds of people without really knowing, again, what you want them to get done. So you may find somebody you like to work with, but they don't ultimately have the impact you want them to because you never clarified that. That'd be one. Happy to I maybe give a couple keep, others. Keep if that's, going. <laughs> give, yeah, yeah, keep going. This is, I'm loving this. Yeah. I'm thinking this about my past one. and all the mistakes I've made, by the way. Seriously. <laughs> this is a crazy one, especially for, for you know any listener there that is hiring as part of a team. You've got a lot of people that are going to be interviewing a candidate for this role. Five, six, you know, senior yeah. exec roles at maybe 10. Having each, per, like, treating the interview like it's a one-on-one -on -one little performance with each of these, let's say, eight people. And each person is supposed to come away from their little one-hour performance with the candidate, deciding thumbs up or thumbs down whether I like this person. We all come together and say, I'm a yes, I'm a yes, I'm a yes, I'm a no, I'm a no. I'm That entire notion of interviewing, massively problematic and rampant. We're talking like the majority of companies have that approach. Yes. If we're doing that, everyone's covering the same thing. Everyone is trying to cover the entirety of the person so we're asking the same questions time and time again. Candidate is getting better and more rehearsed at the same questions. We can't cover everything in one hour, so we have to fill in all the, all the gaps with our, our biases. We end up defaulting to just whether we like them or not. And this whole notion of viewing it as a performance, you end up with somebody who's great at like spontaneous speaking or just acts the part, as opposed to really diving into what they've actually done in their past. So That's been my, that's how it always I get jobs, by the way, Jordan. I'm just, I can talk fast. <laughs> yeah, it's, I would just call it one like redundant interviewing, having everyone. And, it, yeah. And what's the, what's, what do you do instead of that? W what you can call like divide and conquer specialist interviewing. Yeah. So if I've got, let's say I've got six people on the interviewing team, I'm the hiring manager. I've got a senior peer of mine and I've got, uh, what is that? Four team members and the six of us are going to do interviews. Let's give everyone a role based upon where they sit. There's a certain number of things that we're trying to learn about this person. There may be a number of, of facets of the role that involve technical skills. Some are interpersonal change management. Some are motivational and aspirational. Some may be around team leadership. Let's find those clusters of things that we're looking for. And let's have individuals, of, you know, each of the six of us, go deep on a shorter set of areas to where we're not retreading the same stories over and over again. And we can come back together and I can say, listen, I went deep on the technical skills part because that's kind of where I'm deepest. Here's all the stories that I explored. Here's all the information. And we put it together like a puzzle. And now we have six hours of content instead of one hour on repeat, <laughs> six versions of the same one hour conversation. Right. I really like that. And it, it, you know, it's so interesting because like your clients are private equity firms, right? And I have Some to imagine- yeah. and. And, 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 you know, they're smart people and their job is to assess things. They assess companies, right? They make mm -hmm. decision whether or not invest. So it's, these are not, these are people that know how to dig into things, but they've, many of them have never, I mean, I never got, when I worked in private equity, like I remember interviewing people, nobody trained me. They didn't tell me what to do. We had no strategy. We didn't use the strategy we used to make an investment decision when we decided whether to invest in a person. Like it was yeah. weird how it's just like, we threw, we threw that away <sighs> And, and as a result, I can tell you that th the processes were, um, they weren't very insightful and you ended up, I just remember being like, I have no idea who to pick. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. it's pretty, pretty sad. I mean, you work with like maybe a headhunter or whatever, but, but it is, it is a lack. Now I, I want to get into, uh, do you, do you advise people on like, what are some really good questions to ask? Oh. And what are some questions to avoid? Oh, 
when people find out like, oh, you're, you're an interviewing expert, well, tell me, what, what's the best interview question? Mm-hmm. Well, the funny thing is, if there was such a thing, word would get around and everyone, all the candidates in the world would prepare the perfect answer for the perfect question. So there is no perfect one. I will tell you there's hallmarks of great questions and hallmarks of terrible questions. And I would say the simple like way to think about a good question, it needs to be about facts, not about projections of the future. So you have to be talking to a candidate about things that actually happened. And that there's two ways that that doesn't happen. One is saying, how would you handle a conflict with a peer? you're probably going to get a good answer from a conflict avoidant person, right? They've probably been coached on how to do that. It's not that they don't know any better. There's some emotional or psychological reason why they don't actually do that. So stop asking people how they would behave because they can paint a fictitious picture. The other is basically not having like a real burden of proof. How do you typically handle conflicts with peers? Well, if I ask you how you typically do something, You have no obligation to tell me an actual story. You can make up something that never really happened. I typically do it by insert story that never happened or just an amalgam of things that I wish were true about myself, right? So I would say like principle number one, let's get actual tangible things that happened in the person's past. On top of that, I would say another big one is we got to be careful with the phrasing of our questions. There's this, I would say you see a lot out there in terms of like reputable literature, from respected publications that are telling you to say, tell me about a time when you had a conflict with a peer and you were able to resolve it to get something done on a tight time frame. Like there are definitely people out there saying, this is the right kind of question. Tell me about a time when. You can probably guess there's a couple of problems with a question like that. I've just broadcast what I'm looking for. So if I'm interviewing you and I tell you, tell me about a time when you resolved a conflict and you got something done to you know where your story needs to lead. Even ethical people will fudge their stories because it's awkward Mm. to not have an example for you, right? And I would also say like, anytime that you're asking these tell me about a time questions, you end up loading them with like three or four filters. Conflict, tight deadline, uh, in um, cross-functional role with, uh, you know, the list goes on. Somebody has to sort through their memory banks to come up with this niche story that meets this, four criteria Venn diagram. Keep it simple. Ask about the challenging relationships they've had in their past. If it's about conflict management, ask about four or five or six challenging relationships that they've had in their past and learn the stories without telling them that you want this kind of a resolution or this kind of an outcome, right? Simple, That's open-ended really questions about the past. Yeah. And I assume everything is an open-ended. Do you ever ask closed-ended questions? Oh, very rarely. Interesting thing. On like, have you robbed a bank? No. <laughs> <laughs> what's so funny? You know what's so funny? But like, you've probably heard the problem with, with closed-ended questions is that they don't invite a dialogue. Like if I said to you, um, was, was your business partner mad when you gave her that feedback? That's a closed-ended question because it invites a yes or a no response. And the conventional wisdom is, no, that's going to shut off the dialogue. Not true. It's an interview. Candidates are going to want to talk. They know that they need to fill the air. That's that's not the problem. The real problem is that I am broadcasting a judgment. I'm saying, I think that you upset your colleague. Can you please confirm or deny that? It implies judgment. And when you imply that judgment, for a candidate, this is a super vulnerable conversation. So we need to be very careful. And instead of saying, was she upset when you gave her that feedback? We want to find an open-ended question such as, do you have any guesses? Mm. I would say, tell me more. Tell me more is a great one if you ever stuck. Or just, how did she react when you gave her that feedback? Yeah. Keep it at that level because then you are not showcasing what your judgment was. FOMO. FOMO. One of my favorite ones, by the way, in an open-ended, because something's what happens. I'm curious what you think about this. You're being the pro that you are. You'll ask a question that's open-ended. They'll give you an answer that's a bit uh, like it'll be, you know, it'll be incomplete or unsubstantial. I love just to say, what else? Love it. It's so simple, but typically when people go back for the second dip of the ice cream, they take <laughs> more. Yeah. At least that's my life ex- lived experience. 
I would say anyone who's done a lot of interviewing knows candidates err on both sides. There's some candidates you ask a fairly specific question and you get a 10 minute long response with all kinds of context about a merger that happened in the seventies and the blah, blah, blah. And then there was this person who got hired and then got fired and then they took over for the, Right. And there's also what you just explained, which is the, the story stops. And there's just the sort of quick answer to your question, but you want them to elaborate. Yeah. What else? Great. Or tell me more about that. Great. There's some people you'll never have to use. Tell me more. And instead we have to use other techniques to like, <laughs> Patrick, get in there. <laughs> tell me less. <laughs> uh, we're going to go to the lightning round in a second, but before we do, sure. I have one last question for you, uh-huh. um, which is an open-ended question, which is that, um, you know, as I say, think about pro- one of the hard things about this is that um, self-awareness is so important when you're an interviewer, especially nowadays where the workplace has changed. Like if you've been working and if you've been working for 25 years and now you're interviewing people um, who are much younger than you, who have a different worldview, Mm -hmm. if you aren't self-aware, you could do things that are very unproductive, um, that could turn people off. You could have a lot of issues. Um, Yes. And this happens. You hear these things all the time. And yet, uh, yet teaching people to be self-aware mm. is not easy. And I was just, I was curious if you have a view on how people can, can cultivate self-awareness in these types of scenarios. Oh, great question. I do think that for some people cultivating self-awareness is difficult for some people. There's just, there isn't that natural inclination or curiosity around how do I come across, but I think we overplay that. I think it actually is a more buildable skill than we think it is. And I think it really comes through a real commitment in our lives to solicit and use feedback from other people. So if it's about how you come across as an interviewer, Go do some mock interviews. Just go tell some of your colleagues, hey, I have this interview guy I'm playing with. Can I just have an experience with you and like run through the questions and see what you think? And then at the end of the interview, say, by the way, I do care about your opinion on the questions. How did I come across? How did you feel about our connection? How forthcoming did you feel? Or how much were you holding your cards close? Just get in a place where you're curious about others' feedback. Listen to what they have to say. Don't push back or explain yourself. Just take it as a gift. It's hard not to be self-aware when you approach life that way, I think. That's a great idea. I didn't think about this at all, but you can practice this thing. Go find somebody who may be at the level of the person you're going to interview and do a mock interview with them and say, how did that strike you? How were those questions for you? Do you feel that I interacted with you in a way that was productive, right? Because um, what happens, and this is something I, I think about a lot, is oftentimes when we're senior in our careers, we live in certain places, we interact with certain types of people, and we get in our bubble and we become dinosaurs. And mm-hmm. the world keeps moving. Yeah. And you never want to be the dinosaur. So you have to work at it. Yes. Um, because what happens one day is the dinosaur gets hit by the comet. Is that I think that's how it all ended, right? The meteors or something. Yes. The dinosaur dies, and you want to be a dinosaur that lives. Yep. <laughs> all right. Are we ready for the lighting round? I hope so. Um, all right. Number one, all right. what is a favorite quote? My favorite quote. Uh, I, I really like the Gerstner quote that it's culture is not the most important thing. It's everything. It's a great one. It's, I, I might be kind of butchering or paraphrasing overly, but it's essentially that saying culture really is the only thing. That's Lou Gerstner. Yeah. Throwback strong. Throwback. I know. Very old school. I know what maybe former McKinsey consultant and CEO of IBM. No. That's correct. Yeah. All right. Such a nerd. All right. Yeah, number two. Is like, yeah. Go ahead. Yep. Name a book or podcast that every FOMO sapiens should know about. Uh, what got you here won't get you there. Marshall. Two-time guest of the show, my friend. What an awesome, like the concept and the way it's manifest in the book. I have probably given that to more coaching clients than just about anything. Marshall Goldsmith. Back to That's that self-awareness thing. Boom. All right. 
Number three, a piece of advice you would give to your younger self. Oh, <laughs> man, it, it, this sounds a little bit like I'm um, kissing up to you given your message to the world, but worry less about what other people think of you. Truly. Hmm. So little happiness comes from that. Of course, yeah. don't be awful to other people, but if you're doing it to please other people, you're losing yourself in it. It's so true. Everybody likes you, so <laughs> you didn't need to do anything more than that. You're very well liked, um, even more than me, I think. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I think I tried too hard, maybe. It, it's easy <laughs> to be me. All right, last one. What's your most important memory? Oh, wow. My most important memory... I mean, I, I, I think I had this special happy place that was on the roof of my house as a kid mm. in Dallas watching thunderstorms come in. I've always been fascinated by nature and the world. And I've just, it's a sheer delight of being alive and seeing the awesomeness of the world. I have kind of an amalgam of memories that involve being on that roof. Of course, not when the lightning is actually coming, but when the storm <laughs> is on the horizon coming in yeah. and feeling that excitement, it's just like this, it's a little touchstone for me of like, just isn't it cool to be here? Hmm. There's an awe in it. That's a great one. All right. So everybody, if you want to learn more about Talgo, you can go over to talgo.io. If you want to find Jordan and follow him because, you know, he's got a lot to say, you can find him on LinkedIn. That's in slash Jordan W. Burton. Jordan Burton, co-founder of Talgo. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much. It's been wonderful to be here. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com.